We're going to look at the second part of Genesis 32. Um, we saw uh, again this morning several things outside of chapter 32. We saw how the um, uh, Jacob started off as basically being the one who wanted certain things and the one who was willing to strive with his brother. He was even wanting to race him to get out of the womb and while they're in the womb they were fighting together. Uh, we saw also how he obtained the promise, although the way he obtained it was not the best way to do it. Uh, it was certainly still God's will that he get it, but not precisely in that way, at least according to his word, but according to his plan, that was what he allowed. Again, using the, uh, the sins even of his people uh, to work his will. We saw how the Lord watched over Jacob, uh, blessed him at every turn, even though there were those trying to take advantage of him. And then we see, of course, uh, as we're coming to this particular text, um, his preparation to meet with his brother Esau as the Lord has called him now to go from Paddan Aram, where he had been for many years, back into the promised land, back to the land of his fathers, back to his relatives. And of course, as he goes back there, he realizes that at some point he's going to have to face Esau. So he's preparing for that. Uh, so we see that in Genesis uh, 32 in the earlier part and we see his initial prayer. But then after he prays, we pick up the passage in verse 13 and we'll read from there to the end of the chapter. So he spent the night there. Then he selected from what he had with him a present for his brother Esau, 200 female goats and 20 male goats, 200 ewes and 20 rams, 30 milking camels and their colts, 40 cows and 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys and 10 male donkeys. He delivered them into the hand of his servants, every drove by itself, and said to his servants, pass on before me and put a space between droves. He commanded the one in front saying, when my brother Esau meets you and asks you saying, to whom do you belong and where are you going and to whom do these animals in front of you belong? Then you shall say, these belong to your servant Jacob. It is a present sent to my Lord Esau. And behold, he also is behind us. Then he commanded also the second and the third and all those who followed the droves saying, after this manner you shall speak to Esau when you find him. And you shall say, behold, your servant Jacob also is behind us. For he said, I will appease him with a present that goes before me. Then afterward I will see his face Perhaps he will accept me. So the present passed on before him while he himself spent that night in the camp. Now he arose that same night and took his two wives and his two maids and his eleven children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and he sent across whatever he had. Then Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When he saw that he had not prevailed against him, he touched the socket of his thigh, so the socket of Jacob's thigh was dislocated while he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the dawn is breaking. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. He said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him and said, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob named the place Peniel, for he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been preserved. Now the sun rose upon him just as he crossed over Penuel, and he was limping on his thigh. Therefore, to this day, the sons of Israel do not eat the sinew of the hip, which is on the socket of the thigh, because he touched the socket of Jacob's thigh and the sinew of the hip. Well, may the Lord bless um, his word to our hearing uh, this evening. By the way, forgot to mention, but I'm sure you remember, uh, Esau was on his way with 400 men, and this is why Jacob was doing what he was doing, in order to soften Esau up so that by the time he got to him, Esau might be willing uh, to receive him. Uh, there's a lot going on in this passage, but first of all, remember uh, this morning we saw that after Jacob overcame uh, the first threat, and remember the first threat was Laban, uh, as he came after him because Jacob had left without his knowledge with what he considered to be 
his wealth. Remember when Laban catches up to him, he says, these, these things all belong to me. These are my daughters. These are my flocks. These are my herds. And also, my, my idols are missing. I think somebody uh, took those as well. Well, Laban was threatening him. But that threat was resolved, as we saw, by the Lord's intervention. You recall, based upon his promise to bless Jacob. He appeared to Laban before he actually uh, arrived where Jacob was. He warned him not to threaten Jacob. And that led to the making of the covenant of Mizpah. So the first threat was resolved. But then he had to face a second threat. Uh, he knew that there was going to be difficulty. That's why he sent the messengers ahead to sound out Esau. But the messengers he sent to Esau returned with the news that Esau was on his way with 400 men. And we know that he wasn't coming. Jacob realized he wasn't coming to welcome him. He wasn't coming to shake his hand or to have some kind of a welcoming party. But he was coming to carry out the threat that he had made against Jacob earlier, which was to kill him for robbing him of his blessing. So how, how did he do it? How did he face this threat? Well, first of all, the Lord helped him by encouraging him, by sending his angels out to remind him that he was the one who was protecting him. These were the angels, remember, he saw first when he was on his way to Laban's that were going up and down the ladder with the Lord standing at uh, the, the top of the ladder, which was uh, the symbol of the Lord's protection, sending his ministering angels down to watch over Jacob. And it was also there that the Lord at the top of the ladder, the same one I believe he's going to be wrestling with this evening, confirms the covenant that he had made with Abraham and Isaac, that that covenant now belonged to him. And so as he's returning now to the land of promise, Jacob sees these angels for the second time after so many years, and he was encouraged by the fact that the Lord's promise was still there. The Lord was still protecting him. Secondly, we see that, um, or we saw that Jacob prayed. He prayed to the God with whom he was in covenant. And he prayed, of course, he was in covenant with him through the promise uh, Jacob was saved in the same way that we are through the promised seed who was to come, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he knew that on the basis of this relationship that he had with his Lord, that the Lord would hear and the Lord would answer. We saw that he prayed for grace because he was doing what the Lord called him to do. Lord, you were the one who told me to leave Paddan Aram and to go back to the land. And now I'm in danger. So Lord, would you please see and would you please answer. He also prayed humbly. He confessed that he wasn't worthy that the Lord should answer this prayer. He wasn't worthy of any of the good things that the Lord had, had given to him. After all, he had crossed that same river, a single man, and now he was coming back with this rather large family and all these possessions. He humbles himself before the Lord and acknowledges that all of those blessings came from him. We just saw earlier in, in our um, meditation that we are to devote ourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. He humbled himself and he thanked the Lord for his many, many mercies, none of which he deserved. And he was asking God that he might yet, in his mercy, protect him. He prayed specifically that the Lord would grant him this particular uh, mercy, that he would protect him and his family from Esau. And he based his prayer on God's promise, the promise that he would prosper him, the promise that he would make his descendants as numerous as the sand of the sea. He based it on the Abrahamic covenant and the promised seed who was coming. If that promise was to be fulfilled through Jacob's line, the Lord would have to intervene and protect him. And we noted that this is how we are to face the difficulties that we have to face in this life, and we know those difficulties are numerous. We are also to pray to the Lord for the strength to do his will with humility, asking for specific things and basing our prayers on the promises that he has made to us and confirmed for us through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember that in the Lord Jesus Christ, the promises of God are yes. Now that brings us to our second lesson in prayer that we're going to look at this evening, and that is the fact that we need to persevere in it until the Lord gives us what it is we're asking for, provided, of course, that we're asking for the things that we should be asking for. Now, after Jacob finished his first prayer, 
we need to notice, first of all, that he exercised a bit of wisdom. I mean, what better way to appease Esau than to offer him a valuable gift? Uh, we may not see the animals as such a great gift. In our day, they would be a burden, but in his day, that's the way that wealth was actually measured by the number of animals that you had and you used them sort of as currency and you could buy things with them and you could give them away as gifts and so forth. So Jacob took from his flock, as we look at the list, what might be considered more of the valuable animals, which were primarily females. I don't know if you noticed that most of the animals were the female animals. Whenever you go and, and uh, you, you uh, look at a litter of, of puppies, uh, the first, you know, to be reserved, the first to be sold are going to be the females, always the females, because they're the ones that can bear more young. That makes them more valuable. So Jacob sets aside the majority of females and also the requisite number of males, and he separates them according to their kind, places them in the hands of his servant, and he instructs them what to say when they come to Esau in chapter 32, verse 18. These belong to your servant Jacob. It is a present sent to my Lord Esau. You notice the, um, the humility that's exhibited here. Jacob is humbling himself before his brother Esau, even though he has the promise, even though he is the one who is, uh, the one who is promised to have Esau serve him, he becomes a servant to him. He calls himself the servant, and he calls Esau his Lord. And, and why does he do that? Well, we know what our Lord says about pride and arrogance and exalting ourselves over one another. That's something that is repulsive to him. God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Well, pride isn't only repulsive to the Lord, it has that effect on others as well, which is why humbling ourselves before those that we are at odds with is one of the best ways to seek peace with them. Rather than throwing more fuel on the fire, we should do everything we can to put them at ease and to seek to serve them and to humble ourselves before them. So that is what he's doing. So he gives them this message, and then he sends them ahead of his family. Now, one thing we should note is that Jacob was likely not placing his servants in danger because Esau was not really after them. He had nothing against these servants and he certainly had nothing against receiving such a, a generous gift as they had to offer. Uh, so I don't think he was putting them in danger. Uh, another thing we should note is this, that prayer doesn't rule out the use of means. Sometimes when we pray, we ask the Lord to do something, and we can be involved in it, but we don't get involved in it. We think the Lord is going to answer it without our involvement. But well, we see here that that's not what Jacob did. He didn't just pray and then go about his business as though he hadn't prayed and he wasn't concerned about this, but he acted on that prayer and he did what he thought was the wisest thing to do, offer a generous gift and express humility. Uh, the point is that prayer does not eliminate the means, uh, the means that, that might be used to fulfill that prayer. It actually makes the means to be effective through the Lord's blessing. So after we pray for the Lord's blessing, we do need to act looking to the Lord to bless what it is we do. If we, for instance, pray that maybe the Lord would have mercy on one of our relatives and, and save them, if they haven't heard the gospel, we need to go to them with the gospel and not expect the Lord to save them just simply through our prayers. The same thing, I think, goes, with, uh, goes along with our prayers here that the Lord would have mercy on, on our neighborhood and our neighbors. Uh, we, we can't just pray and expect them to be drawn, as it were, supernaturally to the church here to hear the gospel. We need to bring the gospel out to them. So prayer does not eliminate the use of means. It makes the means effective. And really, although we're not going to look at how this all turns out, the Lord does make it effective. But... There was a lot of prayer that went into this as well. So means don't eliminate prayer, and prayer doesn't eliminate the means. We, we need both of them. But now having sent them ahead, he stayed behind with his wives and his children. 
And then we read that he got up while it was still night and he sent his wives and his children and his remaining servants and the remaining livestock across the Jabbok while he remained alone. And then we come to one of the most interesting accounts that the Lord has given us in his word, this wrestling match between Jacob and this man who just seems to appear. We read in verse 24, Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. Now, we're not really told, at least at first, who this man was or why it was he was wrestling with Jacob. It just almost seems to be out of place. But as we read, we begin to understand what it was that was really going on here. Jacob was again praying to the Lord. He was wrestling with the Lord in prayer because of Esau. Only this time, the Lord came down so that Jacob might do this literally. Uh, we were praying just before we came out here and I was I made this request, Lord, help us to, to pray the way that Jacob prayed. And then I thought, wait a minute, I don't necessarily want the Lord to come down and have to wrestle with him. Um, but if that's what it takes, you know, <laughs> let's go ahead and do that. But this, this again, is, is a, an unusual way uh, that the Lord, or I should say that a man wrestled with the Lord in prayer. Now, we're not actually told when he appeared. Jacob might have sent his family away and his servants and possessions to the other side because he saw that the Lord had appeared, that he had showed up for this match, and so he sent them aside so he could devote his attention to him and to getting what it was that he wanted from him. Or this, the Lord may have actually come in answer to his prayer. He may have sent his family ahead so that he might remain alone and continue to pray for the Lord's mercy and grace. Again, he wasn't taking it for granted that he had that blessing yet, but he wasn't expecting that God was going to come down from heaven literally and show up and begin to wrestle with him. And from what we read in this account, it was really quite an interesting match. We don't know when it began, sometime during the night. We don't know what hour of the night, but we do know when it ended. It ended at sunrise. Now, what's really interesting is that during these hours of struggle, the Lord did not overcome Jacob. And I think that's kind of an interesting point. I don't know if you've read this before and you realize this is the Lord. How, how is it that he had any kind of, you know, he, that he put up any kind of a fight, okay? Well, it's not that the Lord wasn't strong enough to overcome Jacob in a moment because obviously he has limitless strength. But what it means is that he was wrestling with Jacob for a different reason than simply that he might put him down to the ground and win this wrestling match. He wanted to see just how far Jacob was willing to go, whether he was going to throw in the towel quickly or whether he was going to persevere until he had what it was that he was after. Well, as they're wrestling, Jacob would not let go. He would not stop. He wouldn't give up. Jacob persevered. So to test him even further, the Lord reached out and touched the socket of his thigh and dislocated it, which must have been quite painful. But Jacob still would not let him go. Then finally, the Lord told him, let me go. You need to let me go. The dawn is breaking. And then we might wonder, what does that mean? You know, is, is it because the Lord couldn't be seen in the daylight? He had to get out of there? Is it because he couldn't stand the daylight? Uh, it was it because his time was up and he needed to do something else? Well, not really. It wasn't that the Lord's time was up. It's that Jacob's time was up. He needed to cross the Jabbok. He needed to rejoin his family. He needed to be there because Esau was coming. And so the dawn was there. You need to let me go so you can get going. But Jacob still would not let him go. He wouldn't let him go until he blessed him. You know, there's a, a similar example in the Bible of Moses who was seeking the Lord also for a blessing. Remember when he brought, uh, the Lord brought his people out of Egypt through Moses and then there was the incident of the golden calf and the question of whether or not the Lord was going to continue to be with them and continue to bless them. And Moses essentially prays in Exodus 33 verse 15, if your presence does not go up with us, do not lead us up from here. I, I, Lord, I don't want to go unless I have your blessing. I don't want to go unless you're with me. 
And I think Jacob was essentially seeking the same thing from the Lord. He wanted the Lord's blessing and he was willing to wrestle with him and not let him go until he received it. And so really I think that was the point that the Lord wanted him to reach. And when the Lord had brought him to that point, when he had tested him enough, he finally gave him the blessing. We read in verses 27 and 28. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. He said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Remember the name Jacob we saw this morning means the one who supplants, the one who is basically tries to take, you know, what somebody else has. But now his name would be Israel, which means God prevails, or one who prevails with God, or a prince of God. And the reason is because he had wrestled with God. We just saw him wrestling with the Lord. And he wrestled with men. He had already wrestled with Laban, so to speak, and he had wrestled with Esau. He got, he got the blessing. He had wrestled with Laban. He got essentially all the possessions, you know, that, that Laban had. And he had overcome every time. Now, in each case, Jacob persevered until he received what it was he was after. In this case, the blessing of God, and he did it because of God's blessing. So he renames him. You are the one who has essentially wrestled with the Lord, and you have prevailed. That's quite an honor to have such a name. Now, again, we aren't going to look ahead at this, but let me just mention that the Lord takes care of the issue. And when he runs into Esau, the Lord has dealt with his heart, and Esau receives him warmly, so the Lord answers his prayer. Now, one question we should ask is, is this, how do we know that this was the Lord? Well, a few different ways. First of all, Jacob looked to him for the blessing. He thought that he had it to give. Now, it could be that Jacob thought that this man was a priest of God who had the authority to bless him, like Melchizedek, I don't think Melchizedek was the pre-incarnate Christ because the author to the Hebrews actually distinguishes him. He says he was like him, but he was not him. But Melchizedek was a priest of God and he had within his ability to bless Abraham, remember. Abraham paid a tithe to him and he blessed him. And when he told Jacob that he had striven with God and prevailed, he might have taken that to mean you've striven with God and you have prevailed in prayer, therefore the Lord is going to grant you this blessing. So... That doesn't necessarily mean this was God. But the second point was interesting. Jacob asked his name, likely to honor him, but he wouldn't give his name. And I think this made him suspicious of the fact that this was no ordinary man. Now we're going to see, well, we're not going to see later, but we do see later in the Bible that when the angel of the Lord appears to Manoah, the father of Samson and his wife, to, uh, to announce the birth of Samson, Manoah made the same request. We read in Judges 13, verses 17 and 18, Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, what is your name? So that when your words come to pass, we may honor you. Who do I have to thank for this? But the angel of the Lord said to him, why do you ask my name, <clears throat> seeing it is wonderful? Now the word wonderful means extraordinary. The word means incomprehensible. Now when the Lord reveals himself, he does it through names. You know, he, named, he gives certain names by which we are to call him, by which he wants to be known. And he does it primarily through two different names in the Bible. Elohim, which as you know is the plural of the word El, which means God. And Yahweh, which we usually translate Lord, but which means I am. I'm the eternally existing one. This is the name by which he reveals himself to Israel. And then he also combines those names with, with other words to reveal more about himself. For instance, El Elyon, God Most High. El Shaddai, God Almighty. Yahweh Yaira, the Lord will provide. Yahweh Shalom, the Lord is our peace. Now, when he gives these names, he gives them to reveal something about himself not to hide something about himself. None of these names are incomprehensible. 
Again, they're meant to reveal him to us. But here, the angel says, why do you ask my name? It is incomprehensible. It's possible that the Lord was telling Manoah that if he was to use his real name, the true name, the name that really describes who he is, that Manoah would not be able to comprehend that name because God is incomprehensible. There's a, a saying uh, in theology that says the finite cannot comprehend the infinite. We're finite. We have finite minds. We cannot wrap our minds around God. He is infinite in every way. We can know certain things about him. We can know true things about him, but we cannot know him as he is. And I think that's what the angel was expressing. And if that is the case, that's certainly the way that Jacob appears to have understood what he said because of what he says in the next verse. His conclusion from the fact that the angel would not give him his name or this man would not give him his name was this, Genesis thirty-two thirty. So Jacob named the place Peniel. For he said, I have seen God face to face and yet my life has been preserved. The word Peniel or Peniel means literally the face of of God. I saw him. You know, it's like where the place where he saw the ladder, he called that Bethel, which means the house of God. When he saw the camp, remember the angels as he met them along the way, he called that place Mahanaim, which means two camps, because there were two camps there. So oftentimes in scripture, names reflect what happened in that particular place. And here, Jacob saw God face to face. So the one that he was wrestling with was none other than the angel of the Lord whom we believe to be the pre-incarnate Son of God. He wrestled with him, and he obtained the blessing from him. Now, the Lord is showing us the importance of persevering in prayer and what we can expect if, if we'll do this. Now, we, we don't want to draw that conclusion simply because Jacob, you know, Jacob did this. You know, there isn't a one-to-one -one correspondence between everything that Jacob does and everything we're supposed to do. Jacob's situation, what we are to do, what we are to expect from our perseverance in prayer. I mean, many people did many things in the Bible, and not all of them were right. We don't, you know, we don't imitate everyone. We need to know what to imitate and what not to imitate. And even if we did, it wouldn't always produce the same results if we were to do them. But what Jacob does here is what Jesus actually tells us to do. Remember what we read in Luke 18.1 this morning. Now he was telling them a parable to show them that at all times they ought to pray and not to lose heart. The Apostle Paul reminded us in our meditation this evening that we are to devote ourselves to prayer. He says in Ephesians 6.18 that we should pray at all times in the Spirit and he says in 1 Thessalonians 5.17 that we should pray without ceasing, which doesn't mean that there isn't supposed to be a time or a moment during the day that we're not in prayer. I think we should always be aware of the Lord's presence. But what he means is that when we seek the Lord for any particular mercy, we should seek him continually until he gives us that particular mercy. So the Lord not only wants us to pray, he wants us to pray until our prayers are answered. And I think Jacob's prayer is one of the greatest examples of one who took hold of the Lord and would not let him go until the Lord gave him what it was he was asking. You know, the Lord tells us in his word that he hears us as soon as we pray. He knows what we want, even what we're going to ask him, before the words ever leave our mouth. I mean, he knows that from all eternity. God knows absolutely everything. There's nothing he can learn. Nothing surprises him. So you might think, well, do I even have to pray if that's the case? Well, yes, we do because the Lord tells us that we need to do that. We need to vocalize our requests and show our dependence upon him. But he doesn't always answer our prayers right away. As a matter of fact, he will often delay his answers until the time is right. And the time is usually right when we want it badly enough. Have you ever noticed that when you're in a crisis and something has to happen right away and you seek the Lord, you usually see a quick answer to prayer. But when it's a little bit further off, perhaps the answer doesn't come quite as quickly, perhaps because 
we don't lay hold of the Lord quite as earnestly as we would under the other circumstances. He holds back until we have the kind of earnestness, the kind of zeal, the kind of trust and faith, the kind of desire that we need to receive those particular blessings. You know, in a very real sense, the Lord, again, is using these trials and He's using our prayers in response to those trials as a means to help us grow more into the image of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we need to realize that even when we're praying, the Lord is training us. The Lord is holding back. I mean, why was He wrestling with Jacob? He was trying to see how far Jacob would go. He wants, I mean, he knew, but he wanted Jacob to see, and he wanted Jacob to go that far and reach that point. And sometimes the Lord does that, perhaps often he does that with us so that we will desire these things the way that we should. So if there is a particular mercy that you need from him, you do need to pray. The Bible says if you don't ask, you won't receive. You need to pray based upon his promises. You know, the promises guaranteed by the Lord Jesus Christ in the covenant of grace. That's the only way you and I are going to receive anything is through Jesus. You need to pray believing. If we don't trust him, he's not even going to give us what he's promised to give us. The one who doubts isn't going to receive anything from the Lord. We need to trust him. But we also need to pray until he answers. Must not let go of him until you have what it is that you've asked. Now again, this reproves all of us. We need to persevere in prayer. And it's meant to get us to do what we need to do so that the Lord will give us the things that we need. We need to learn the lesson that David learned that was his comfort in difficult times. We read a great example of it in Psalm 62, verses 1 through 8. But let me simply close with this last example from Psalm 27, verses 13 and 14. David writes this, I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. In other words, wait upon Him and continue to look to Him until He gives you that desired mercy. Well, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to help us do this.